I'm all the way in Southend in the UK and I'm interviewing an extraordinary man. A man who went through so much following a car accident right here in the UK. He spent seven months in the hospital because none of his friends would come to his aid. This is a story of hope and he has written a book that I'm sure would inspire anybody who reads it. A story of not giving up, a story from Richard Kojo Echampo. Oh, hi, hi Richard. Richard. How, How are, are you? you? I'm nice very, to very see you. nice to see you too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my name is Richard Echampong. 25 years ago, the dreams that I carried as a boy to change my personal and family circumstances came crashing when a vehicle ran me over and sped off into thin air. For the next eight months, my home was the Barnet General Hospital, where I lay fighting for my leg and the right to remain in the United Kingdom. Sadly, I lost my forefoot during the fight. And for the next nine years, I had to fight the immigration and asylum system to remain in the United Kingdom. Thereafter, I began to rebuild my life piece by piece. Today, I'm a qualified lawyer in two jurisdictions, and I've established businesses employing over 100 British citizens. My story is about redemption, resilience, and the unwavering and deep nature of the human spirit to overcome adversities and trials. I've captured these moments in a book called Crash But Not Destroyed. It's a book of hope, and I entreat everyone to read it. Thank you. 1998, to be exact, was the year that you first stepped foot in the UK from Ghana. Richard, you've got an amazing book. Reading your book has really inspired me. I want to speak to you about your journey, how you started, and why you think that there is hope for people. So let's go back to the Volta region where you started from, where you were born and how you made the transition to the UK. So I stayed most of my life with my mother and um, the family in which I come from had very, very humble circumstances. You know, the poverty is legendary. So from very early age, I wanted to change something. I had this sense of redemption on my shoulders. Mm. I definitely want to change the family circumstances. We do not have much opportunities in where I was born, but I knew one thing could open the doors for me to change my family circumstances. That is education. Yeah. So right from very young age, I started working very, very hard. Something changed my perception about life, which gave me the zeal and energy to drive forward. Mom had an elder child called William. When I was younger, William was everything I looked up to. He was handsome, intelligent, well-spoken, and mom invested every single thing that she had in William. She expected that William would grow up one day, take up employment and to look help after her look him. after the family. Because mm. you had 14 brothers and sisters. Yes, in total. That is her. From your, from your mother's side and your from father's that's, side. That's correct. And you were the fifth born from both sides. That's correct. Okay. So mom had seven. Yeah. And, uh, you know, William had um, uh, mental problems. Mental and, uh, health, yeah. Eventually we lost him and uh, the circumstances under which we lost him is very, very so, difficult. Yeah. And, uh, it's very emotional when I think about it. So when we lost William, I felt the button has been passed to me. Mm. Mom was 19 when he, she had wow. William. And the three girls came before I came. Okay. So the idea was that William would be the torchbearer. And that is why mom poured all her energies, all her resources into William. And when we lost William, that was very painful, not only for my mother. And the circumstances under which we lost William made it even more difficult. Uh, before we lost William, we were rejected basically by the town folks. Because he had mental problems. So as I think in rural Ghana, mm. people will be thinking of 
but it's because of something that the family might have done. Mm. So this is the payback. Mm. So we're taunted, you know. We couldn't fit in. So you see the pain in this woman's eyes. Where we lived, it's not wasn't fit for purpose. And at very early age, I wanted to change that. Let me just touch on mental health in Ghana yeah. and how even at that age you could see that it's not well perceived. Yeah. People then took it out on your parents, on your family, and you had to move out of the area because of your brother. How was the perception of mental health? People have this idea that the family may have done something wrong, mm. and this is the payback time. And so they literally wanted William to be removed from the village. Wow. Now, the housing in which we were living at the time, I felt it was ours. Apparently, it wasn't ours. I came back from school. One afternoon, this woman was very dejected, very emotional. He said, Richard, we've got to leave this house. And I said, what for? Though it wasn't the best of places, I fitted in it as a compound house. Mm -hmm. as it where we had a lot of boys in there. We played together, we eat together. So to be told one fine afternoon that you have to move. We, are, we are moving it was very difficult. Within a few weeks, we had moved to my auntie's dilapidated property, which was really ways of where we came from. from. For a short while, I rebelled. I said, look, th this is not right. And we had issues there as well. So all these things shaped my orientation. It gave me that energy, that desire mm. to change our family circumstances. So in no time, I was ahead of my sister, whom I come after mm. in school. When my sister was still in form one, I was in form two. Okay. When I entered the secondary school, my sister was still in middle school. Because something was driving me forward. I don't know whether you remember Alafia Bide. The man came from our village. Mm -hmm. We went down there one day with mom and I saw this man. He was the only person who had a story house in the village and a car. Mm. So we went up there, I saw a rug in his room. You know, he was for the first time. For the first time. Yeah. So when we came out, I said, Mom, why is it that Nani Alafia has got this massive house, a car, look at where he's sitting. He turned around emotionally and he said, Richard, if you work hard, mm. she'll be like running out of here one day. I'm going to read something from your book. It said, Richard, it's your turn now. You must step into William's shoes. You are the one who will lift this family up. That is rather me speaking to myself. Oh, this is you speaking to yourself. That's okay. Correct. Why did you say that to yourself? At what moment in your journey? William was everything I wanted to be. So when we lost William, I felt that if this, the, the family circumstances has to change, it has to be me. So I was speaking to myself saying, look, at this time you step into William's shoes. William is no more. We can't find William. The family has to be redeemed. It should be Richard. And then... Your essay, so how you got to the UK in the first place. Tell us about that. Okay. That was at university mm. in 98. Uh, I ended 96 and uh, there was a bit of disruption. UTAG was, you know, rebelling against government, you know. So a few of my friends came to the UK. They come back with a nice pair of shoes. They had money to spend. So I said to myself, look, I've got to come to the UK. One hopefully to find work mm. during the holidays, two, to visit the campus of LAC. Yeah. So th these were the two reasons. So I sat down and said, look, I don't have the money. How am I going to do this? So I went to Kumasi uh, to a cousin of mine, and I said, look, I want to travel. She looked at me and said, look, but you don't have money. I said, yes, I do not have money. So we had a plan. The plan was that going to family, you can, you can make some money. I said, oh, really? Yes, because this is something I've been doing from the age of 13 anyway. Wow. So we went down to Barakesi. Uh, there is a village called Amam from on the Barakesi road. We went to see the chief, a little piece of land, about five acres or so, cultivated tomatoes for two seasons, and I made enough money. Wow. But at one point, we were harvesting about 40 boxes of tomatoes. tomatoes. So that's how I made money. And I became a member of the British University North American Club. Okay. So we applied for a visa to come on tour. So they gave us a working holiday visa. And on the 22nd of June, 1998, 
Uh, we actually le left on the night of 21st. Okay, and, and arrived the on the 22nd. 22nd. And how so was it when you arrived in the UK? Well, everything was new. Uh, when the plane was touching down, looking down, seeing all the houses and everything, uh, it was just amazing. It was awesome. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, uh, well, I'm here now. Mm -hmm. The dream has finally come true. And what did your mom say to you before leaving? Funny enough, I didn't tell my parents that wow. I was traveling. I got here invited, I told them. Wow. Yeah. Why did you do that? Well, as a silly, stupid kid, I always had this superstition, superstition that, okay. oh, the plane is not going to move. Let, let me get on the face. <laughs> That is a lot of Ghanaian and African superstition. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> okay, so then you landed, at the time you were, what, 26? 26, 26, yes. 26 years yeah. old, and then something happened. Yeah. 1998. Yeah. A fatal evening night after cleaning, after your job. That's right. Tell us about the types of jobs you were doing uh, when you arrived in the UK. When we got here, BUNAC, British University of American Club, obviously, we came on their tickets. So yeah. The finest um, work picking strawberries at Rochester in Kent. Okay. Specifically, the farm. there was a farm there. So we picked strawberries for one week. Okay. And uh, something funny happened. I picked the first day I picked about 13 boxes of strawberry. And the next person picked 12. So the supervisor of the farm came down to me and said, What, is, what, what are you doing? Is this all for you? Or did, did you have to take boxes from the yeah. other people? And I said, I did that. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> How did you do 30? Yeah, the following day, they had eggs all around and I was ready to start where I stopped. Anyway, we came back to London after a week. And uh, I met Collins, you know, because I had phoned him after I was coming. So Collins is your friend? Yeah, but he was my teacher. Who's your school. teacher at school? Yeah. I've been very close to him, you know, um, when I was in secondary school. He met me at Edgeway. We went home, and uh, amazingly, the house was full of uh, people from our community, and everybody was very happy. You know, they knew about my express, about the AC, mm -hmm. and everything. And in fact, when I left Six Form as well, my name was um, published in the papers because I had a job at uh, BBC as a newsreader, which uh -huh. I did. Yeah, so everybody was happy with Richard, uh, Richard, and uh, so three days later, I found me a cleaning job at William Hill. In the morning. Yeah, William Hill, wow. Yeah. <laughs> From morning, four o'clock to six o'clock. Okay. When I come back home, then I, I had another job at a, a car dealership. Mm -hmm. where we clean vehicles. Okay. I finished that at six. And I go on to the hospital where I had the accident. We we'll talk about that yeah. in a moment. Do another two So hours. you're doing three jobs? Three jobs, yeah. Just to make ends meet? Yeah, I mean, of course, I wanted to... Uh, have some money. I don't like living on other people's money. Yeah. I wanted to make some money. So that was what I was doing. Then, on the 3rd of September, finished work, coming home, very, very tired, always looking forward to getting home, have a hot bath and uh, catch some sleep before, before the next. get up at 3 a.m. because mm. I've got to go to this William Hill team. Yeah. So at the, at the time, you weren't going to university, you weren't studying? I had finished second year okay so i was on long vacation to the to go into yeah, the third year that's right. right so we came in june mm -hmm. and then i was supposed to be going back mm. at the end of uh, which uh, university of Which Ghana. okay yeah uh in september to start my right. final year anyway so the bus stop is just across i guess the hospital gate yeah uh, there was this hill i looked both sides everything was cleared and by the time i go to the bus stop uh, that was it. My life changed. Lying at the bus stop, all I <coughs> felt was that my tooth was very, very, very dry. Wow. The nurses, because obviously it is a hospital area, but the nurses were all over me. Don't move. That is all I could hear. And I said, look, I'm so thirsty. I need some water. They said, you cannot drink water now. And initially, I didn't know the extent of the accident. My good friend Eric was there because all the guys that uh, came, we were doing work just across. Okay, each changes. other. Yes. Okay. So Eric was there. In no time, the ambulance arrived and uh, we went to Barnet General Hospital. 
You go to the hospital and I remember the time it was just past 15 minutes past 10 p.m. And uh, they said, look, they couldn't take my trousers off naturally because there is a lot of bleeding. Yeah. yeah. So they, they cut it open and then moments later I was in a theater. From that night, the next thing I saw was the following day, 6 p.m. I was in the recovery room. First thing I saw was the clock on the wall. It was 6 p.m., mm. which meant I've been in the theater over 16 hours. That was... And I could feel my face very puffy. But I couldn't make sense out of what was happening. And then I saw it, then I saw one of my housemates. And uh, the following day, they said uh, they were going to move me to the ward. So I went to the ward. The doctor came the third day, and uh, the first thing I asked the doctor is when I'm going home. Because at, at this point, I've not realized the seriousness, the seriousness of, the, of, the of the accident. And so, sorry, the, we, let's go back. The accident, the guy, he ran away. It was, it was a hit and run. It was hit and run. That's correct, yeah. Wow. Yeah. They never found him. No, the police didn't do anything. Anything about it. It was uh, something that I try to take the police on. To get to some point, yeah, you kind of spend then, more yeah, feelings on, on it. litigating, yeah, yeah. But they did come to my house to apologize to me, okay. And I do remember the name of the superintendent that mm. came, Ian Sanderson is his name, wow, yes, it registers, wow. yeah. So that is what happened on the night and a few days thereafter. And then you mentioned in your book that your friends left you, there was nobody after a while. Everybody stopped visiting you. That's correct. Um, the first few weeks, people came in that droves to visit me and to express their sympathies. Thereafter, the numbers started going down. You become a forgotten entity. I do understand people have got their own businesses to run. People have got to take care of their pills. I was in the hospital by myself, naturally. My people from my community, people from Ghana, you know, was in the hospital. I remember I was in hospital for seven months. Mm. And my friends with whom I came had all come back to university. The people I stayed with, the first of them, first four weeks, they were there. So it was very long. Now, things became worse. My food got swollen. swollen. And I believe you're going to the talk grotic. about meditation. Yeah. Yeah. I went back to the theater more than six times, you know. They put pins in my yeah. leg. Uh, the food got swollen, you know. And I uh, had to operate it. So the sad thing is, um, on the day of the operation, I had tried to call my friends, I had tried to call the people like me to come and give me support. Which of course my surgeon, uh, Mr. Lo, felt was very, very necessary because he called it your big day. Yeah. So on your big day, you do need people to support you. Yeah. So having made an arrangement, and I said, look, I'm still calling people. So the operation was supposed to be at 11 o'clock on the 30th of of October. Mm -hmm. Now Mr. Lowe had come to see me in the morning and said, Richard, you're going to do it. He's one of the kindest doctors you can ever think of. Wow. If you read a book, you know, my relationship with you him, him very, very, close. very deep. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, look, I have spoken to as many people as I know. So he came back, 10.45, is anybody here? I said, no. So well, look, I do want somebody to be there, Richard, he said. 11, 11, 30, 12, no one. no one. So, Sister Margaret came to me, the, the board sister, and said, yeah. look, is anybody here? I said, no. So Mr. Lowe came and said, look, we'll do this at one o'clock. We've delayed it for two, for two hours. Yes. So at 1 p.m., I was in the theater, and uh, came out at 4.30. Mm. And that was one of my saddest days. 
So it's a very emotional day for me. Because this operation is nailed by mouth, by the way. Yeah. You don't have to eat anything. Yeah. So I came back and the, they wanted me to drink some water. And I was very, very emotional. I knew my foot has been amputated. Mm -hmm. I knew that. I was all dressed up, but I was very, very scared to look at what was beneath mm -hmm. the duvet. Mm -hmm. Very, very scared. So I lay there, they said, drink water, Richard. They took me into drinking some water. Then eventually they said, you've got to eat your food. I said, look, no now. So I was lying there, you know, going through the emotions, conducting a lot of mental gymnastics. What is this thing going to look like? I was so scared. 10 p.m., I couldn't do it. You couldn't look. 11 p.m., I cried. I cried my heart out. Then all of a sudden, something came over me. I threw off the duvet, the bedding, and I saw my leg gone, my foot gone, panicked like a ball. And uh, I was there alone. Couldn't speak to anybody. Lovely. That was the day I missed my mother. Hmm. I needed my mother at that time. I've been strong all this while, mm. but that was very emotional. And I had to deal with all this by, by myself. By yourself. Yeah. And that's why I guess, you know, again, you wrote in the book, our public face may smile and laugh, but it, it may show pride or exclude welcome. But in most cases, it will not reveal our scars. So I think that in that moment, those were the scars that you were going through. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, you know, nobody was there with you. No. No. Yes, I, I needed support. I accepted that I didn't have my biological family here at the time. But I needed people I can speak the same language mm. with, not English. I wanted to express myself in my own dialect yeah. and say, look, this is hurting me. I wanted somebody to hug me at the time. Mm. So this guy is still there. There is no way I can deal with it. The pain that this caused me is there. It's emotional. You cannot squire it away. Yeah. But mm. it's still there. So I laugh. I put up this corporate image, you know. Probably you've seen some of that. I wear nice sheets to work mm -hmm. and I carry nice briefcases. You know, anybody who sees me, I give them a firm handshake. Mm -hmm. But deep within me, I'm scarred. Mm -hmm. Emotionally. Emotionally. And physically, I'm scarred yeah. as well. Yeah. And I think that's general in life. There's a lot of people that are going through things, right? But we all just... We put up appearances. We put up appearance. Yeah. But then you found a garden angel yes. that you call her a garden angel. Three of them. I think. Three of them. Yes. I think there was Mary, Margaret, and Diane. And Diane. Yeah. Why would you say they're your garden angels? What happened and how did they come into your life? In the first week after the amputation, this blonde, white lady walked into the room. So my name is Mary. And I smile. I welcome her. She came in and then sat down and she introduced herself. So my friend is Kitty. Kitty was somebody who was opposite my door because I was in the private world. Oh, okay. Yes. So Kitty has spoken about you. Kitty said, oh, there is this poor Ghanaian boy all alone in this hospital. <laughs> oh. So I've just visited Kitty and I wanted to see you. Oh. So she came in, we spoke and he said, have you spoken to your mother? I was like, I'm taking a bath. What does she know about my Yeah. Mother? The honest truth is that I had not spoken to my mother at the time. Yes, my mother knew I had had an accident but she does not know the extent of it. Yeah. Probably if she knew, she would have passed away. Oh, <laughs> she would have Bless panicked. Her. Yeah, she would yeah, have she's panicked. She's 80 now. So Mary, before she left, she gave me five pounds. She said, because you have not spoken to your mother, take this money. I know you can buy a telephone card to mm. call your mother. Mm. So she gave me the five pounds. But before she walked away, she got very close to me, gave me this big hug and a kiss on my forehead and said, I love you. Oh. And I remember these words like yesterday. And that ignited something in me. That somebody loves me. Wow. And at the door, she said, 
It was a Tuesday, by the way. And at the door, she said to me, I'll come back next Tuesday to see you. And she also asked me, what do you want me to bring you? And I said, look, Mary, I came here in the summer, so I would need some winter clothing. True to her words, the following Tuesday, Mary was around. She came with a box full of wow. winter clothing. And she bought me a cake from Harrods. And I do remember the price. It was 36 pounds mm. in 1998. Mary continued every single Tuesday. She would come to see me. And in fact, she made my Christmas wow. of 1998 the best. Wow. She came down to the hospital, told them she wanted to take me home, got a wheelchair, took me home, and I spent, she lives just five, ten minutes away from, from the hospital. hospital from Barney. I spent Christmas with the entire family. Soon, anytime Mary came, she came with um, her family. The second, third time she came, she came with her sister, Margaret, who is now late. So they kept coming. Normally, 5.30 to 6, they'll be there. So if it is past 6 o'clock, they are not there. There. I become apprehensive. Are they not coming? Oh. <laughs> anyway. Because they're all your, your regular visitors, yes. the only visitors. Mary is still a part of me. Mary wow. gives me about a £1,000 every single birthday of mine. Wow. I've said to her, look, Mary, I've made ima- enough money. I'm comfortable in life. I don't need your money. But she still does. Why do you think that she... Because you said that she doesn't have any children, so maybe... No, she yeah. Mary did say, look, read your attorney says, I can adopt you. Mm. If you were younger, I was going to legally adopt you. So between you and me, you're my adopted son. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you go to Mary's house, I've got my pictures everywhere. Wow. And then she says she talks to the pictures. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. Mary says she talks to the pictures and she loves me. How old is Mary? Mary's 93 now. 93. Right. Wow. 93. Anyway... The second guardian angel is Mumfong. She was then a student nurse at the time. So we met at the hospital. And be, me being talkative Richard, I started to teach at the hospital. Because I stayed there for a long time. Okay. Um, I was quite good in research when I was in Lagos. Mm. So I read the books and uh, I teach. So Mumfong said, look, Lefa, I can help you. You know, you're doing your schoolwork. Bring it out. I want to read. Mumfong was really good because she transferred from a previous word to the next word in which they transferred me. Right. She insisted she wanted to come with me. So she would come, she would speak ways of encouragement and etc. Now, when I left the hospital and I finished my first degree, and I'll tell you in a moment how I finished the first degree, I applied for a master's, I applied for a lot of scholarships, I wrote to a lot of charities, but looking for funding. I didn't get this funding. The day I was supposed to report yeah, or to start um, my studies, she called me up. Richard, did you st- manage to start? I said, no. Why? I said, I didn't I have, have the, the money. Yeah. So what? She has then qualified as a nurse. She said, come over this evening. I'll get you this money. 2,650 pounds. Wow. I went down. She gave me this money and gave me 25 pounds. I said, take a cab. Go down to the university and really start wow. and start. And for my phone, she calls me my brother even after today. Then the third guardian angel. Diane. Diane. My ex-girlfriend. Mm. Yes. Diane was a nurse who was looking after me, but somehow, if you read a book, you know, when she came down the first day, she saw the state of my room, my clothing and everything. I think she was very appalled. I was allocated four hours a week. She spent the entire four hours cleaning up my environment. Wow. She was supposed to do the shopping, doing the cleaning within that four hours, but she spent the entire four hours cleaning up the place. She took my clothes away the first day. And subsequently, she would call to check on me. She brought me food. Um, she came, came to clean up my Your room wound. because people were not doing it. The, the district nurses, look, they do have a lot of work. I'm not blaming them. Yeah. She, this is how the relationship... So this happened. is when you were discharged. Yes. But how did you get discharged? Okay. Because you had a bill. <laughs> That's correct. Um, I think I did mention a moment ago that I was in a private ward. Yes. Yeah, so I'm a 
apart from everything separate. It's, yeah. it's nice, but yeah. they are just brought up that mm -hmm. way. Normally, uh, as I understand, when the Arabs come to hospital, that's, that's where they stay. Mm -hmm. At the time, I think it was going for some good amount of money per night, and I stayed there for several months. Anyway, they did series of serious operations. The first night, I think they, they had eight doctors, you know, trying to do this. Apparently, they were trying to um, reconstruct my arteries because right. my arteries were completely okay. damaged. And as I understand, my arteries are extraordinarily small. Mm. And so it was very, very difficult. difficult. So they called other consultants. So they spent a lot of money on me. So when I was leaving hospital, the hospital administrator came in, a white blonde lady, spoke to me just before lunch and said, oh, we understand you are leaving hospital very soon, you know, blah, blah. She carried on and said, you are a private uh, patient, you came to the hospital as a private patient, and as, as it is, you are now entitled to free NHS treatment, so this is your bill. So I opened it, it was some huge amount of it. Hundred and something thousand. Yeah, hundred of a hundred thousand. Yeah. And I panicked. And I said, if they've served my entire family, I don't think we can even <laughs> pay for this anyway. So I gave her the bill back, and I said, listen, I want to tell you something. So she sat down. And honestly, I don't know where that spirit came. And I said, listen, number one, I am entitled to free NHS, okay? The reason is this. I came to this country, I have worked, I've contributed to national insurance. And I asked, do you know why people contribute to national insurance at all? She said, tell me. I said, well, national insurance is a pool of fund mm. in which the government draws that money to, to help people who mm. need it. They need social services or medical. That is number one. Number two, I did not come here as a private patient. I came here as an emergency. And any human being, whatever you, wherever you find yourself, if you have an accident, the government of that country must, on humanitarian grounds, look after you. Number three, I'm a citizen of the Commonwealth. Does she know? Do you know what the Commonwealth is? She was just looking at me. As a citizen of Commonwealth, I'm in this country, I've had an accident, I'm equally entitled to as any other person. Four, for chasing me in my sick bed, I am going to ask my solicitors to write to you. She went red in the <laughs> face. And I'm not planning this. Well, how I'm did you think about this. all of this? I'm not rehearsed this from anywhere. My goodness. And she stood up. She forgot her jacket and I said, come back. <laughs> Apparently, she has wow. gone to the nurse's station. She's told the nurses that Richard needs to pay. pay. Yes. Mm -hmm. The nurses laughed me. Everybody was worried. So she went back and she told the nurses that this is what I've said. Within moments, my room was full. I couldn't even eat my lunch. <laughs> The nurses were clapping, they were hugging me. They said, Richard, how did you, what have you done? Wow. Then, 45 minutes later, a director from the hospital came to my room to apologize. Wow. That is how I ended up not paying that bill. Wow. <laughs> hey. That is how I ended up not paying that bill. That is God. That is God. Because. That is God. You should have paid that bill. Uh, well, if they sell the entire family, I don't think they'll be able to pay it at the time. Mm. Let's jump to 2006. Yeah. When that 119,000 check came in. Tell us about that. Yes, um, I had an insurance payment because of the accident. The first thing I wanted to do is to settle my mother. So I did settle her. Oh. But I had this vision of this money must not be wasted. So I invested it into the business, majority of it. So it did stabilize my finances. It did help me to pay some of the people who have helped me. For several reasons, my phone gave me money. Of course, they didn't loan me the money. As a sign of um, yeah. good riches, yeah. I gave them their money back. Wow. So it stabilized my finances for a while. Invested it into my security company. 
and the company wasn't very, really doing well at the time. So we even borrowed money, sixteen thousand oh. pounds. You know, but before that, you did your law, or no, was that with I the done law okay? Time. So you did the security first. Yes. Okay. Uh, first two thousand before this insurance. Yeah. I finished my masters, and I got recruited by NTL. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be owned by Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So we went through all the recruitment processes. We went for the induction at Warwick University. And we were asked to submit our documentation for verification. They want to verify to see whether mm. we can live and work over here. No, I didn't have it. So yeah. I wrote a letter from my solicitor that my passport was at the home office. So, so are you under immigration control? And I said, yes. So they said, all right, me. For this letter, I got a message that they couldn't recruit me. Wow. Because they don't apply for work permit. I cried. That was the second time. Then I said to myself, if nobody is ready to employ me, I'll create employment for myself. That was when I established my first business. Wow. With no papers at all. Wow. Yeah, I heard it on the news that there was shortage of teachers everywhere. I called up an agency in uh, Tottenham. They gave me some business advice. So I called my cousin, who had then come to the call Prosper. And then my nephew, I said, Look, I've got this idea. I want to go into business. So both of them said, ah, but how can you go into business? You don't even have the document. I said, no, no, that is not important. <laughs> no, there was some fire burning in my stomach. Wow. So I called them in. When they came, I said, look, I've spoken to uh, Tottenham Green Enterprise Center. They said, look, we can register a company. So names. So we started juggling names. And all of a sudden, we arrived at this. Winston, Winston, we thought it was very English at the time. Yeah. So we registered it to supply teachers. Mm. Now, the advice they gave us was that it was going to take you six months at least to get your first client. Wow. Remember, I had this small little studio flat, mm -hmm. very, very small, with a single bed in there. So we installed a business line in there. In oh Wood my Green. goodness. Then we did these flyers. The flyers are looking by the flyers were not, were not properly done anyway. We gave them to this newspaper distributors. Okay. You know, the local newspaper yeah. distributors. The distributor days, three days later, the phone started ringing non stop. Oh my goodness. So I called Prosper. I was sleeping one day at 7 o'clock, the phone rang. So I picked it up. <laughs> so, hello, hello. My, my, my voice was angry. Everybody would know this guy was sleeping. <laughs> oh, we need three teachers. I remember the first school, Latima School, very, very poor school in um, Enfield. Called. They, they needed three teachers. I took down the data and the food kept going. So I called Prosper. I said, Prosper, listen, this is what is happening. Prosper said, Richard, don't worry. I said, What are we going to do? Prosper trained as a teacher. Mm -hmm. He went to University of Cape Cod. So they called him some of his friends. Then we started send, sending the wrong teachers into the right oh. jobs and then everything just collapsed. Oh, no. Bad feedbacks. So we decided, Look, we can't do it. We can't do it. Let's go into nursing. Nursing, we registered nursing, changed the name from teaching services to human resources. Nine months, nothing was happening. Oh. Um, Diana was looking after me at the time. Okay. She provided my meals and everything, my clothing and everything. So we went up back to the um, the agency, the, uh, the advisory agency. They said, look, get in touch with um, Princess Trust. We got in touch with them, they gave me a grant of 500. And they gave us a loan of three and a half thousand pounds. So we rented out the place. Posh office, no business. Oof. So somebody said, oh, go and see a, a, a man called Godson Lama, who is still my member, he's still in my life. He was running a nursing agency, so we went in there. So he said, come with me. We tender for this business, we did. And we won the tender wow. for the learning agency project. And we were recruiting some of the most amazing um, Nurses you can't find any way. Oh. We had a plan. They said we are not going to employ any person who is over 60. So the ladies from 23 Upward. to 40. Mm -hmm. you over that. So the nurses were very good. So we did we, we made some we made success of that. Okay. Then in 2007 we wanted down the company because we lost the contract. Okay. And then we went into security. Together. Uh, me and Prosper. Okay. Yes. We went into security, and um, this is when I invested all my money into money. Okay. And um, it didn't really do well. Mm. We struggled for a long time. 
and Prosper left. So when to he Ghana? Left, yes, he okay. left to Ghana. When he left to Ghana, I lost all the insurance money. Wow. We had borrowed 60,000 pounds from the bank. And it's also like, I said, okay, fine. Here I am, Richard. You know, it's you now. It's good to find. Yes. I started driving around this country, Birmingham, Manchester, Southampton, everywhere. Newcastle, Middles, everywhere looking for work. Then this turn around okay. came. So you asked me about law. So I'm moving to law now. Mm. So one of my clients, anyway, with all this while I was struggling with immigration, maybe you, maybe actually, yeah, I yeah. was really struggling with immigration. Yeah, because how are you coping? I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Mm. So one of our clients preached our contract. So I decided, look, I don't have the money to be taking services. So I took them on myself. And I got around 10,000. 10, that was wow. in 2011. So I said to myself, okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> Richard, you've got to go to law school. I've always mm -hmm. wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I went to PPP, mm -hmm. you know, to do my LFP. I started even with a diploma because the requirement to go to law school is a degree in law. Okay. So I got my degree, my diploma. So I went into um, University of Law to train as a solicitor. And I even I converted the diploma to an mm -hmm. LLP. Mm -hmm. I topped it up, I call it. So I finished in 2015. And I said, oh, here we come. I'm going to Ghana and qualify as a barrister because I may be practicing in Ghana. Wow. So I went, the people doubted me because my prosthetic foot gets really warm. So people said, oh, you cannot do it. It's very difficult. How did you go to Ghana without your papers and then come back? No, I, I, well, I got the papers eventually. Okay. So I went to Ghana mm -hmm. and then, you know, qualified. Then I was called to the bar. 2016, 30th of September. That was one of my happiest days. Wow. If you read the book, there's a film called Del and Co. Mm -hmm. There's a Nigerian guy, Dele. I had gone to many solicitors, Cockings. They write all these things and nothing happened. I went to see... Barbara Rose, she was my uh, MP at MP. the time. They didn't want she got fed up with me. Anytime I even got to her office, so I have not heard anything. She didn't even want me to sit down wow. anymore. Because I think she was so fed up. Yeah. So what the, <coughs> excuse me, at the time I was in Wood Green and moved to Finchley because I, I got back out in Wood Green. Oh. So when I moved to Harlow, Bill Ramo was then the conservative MP. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to see Bill Ramo, Bill Ramo said, look, I'm not here to help illegal immigrants stay in this country. And I said, look, I'm not illegal. It's just that I am under immigration control. And he said, what is the difference between, between being illegal and, and being under immigration control? I said, there is a difference, but I can't tell you. I said, look, I am under immigration control, but I'm not illegal. Look, I'm, I'm running a business. Getting my immigration status regularized will help this economy. So we battled it out and then wow. eventually she said, okay, fine, I'm going to write to the home office, but I can't guarantee you anything. I said, all I'm asking is write, write to the to home them. office. Yeah. Because wow. you're my MP. <laughs> and he was really looking at me like, I'm Who's nice this crazy? Yes. Who's this crazy guy? I shook his hand properly and made my representation and left. So he wrote a letter to the home wow. office. Wow. Then at the time, I had changed solicitors to... Dell, Dell and Co. Because Hawkins, who was then my solicitor, did all this happen, and then nothing would happen. They gave happen. me two years in 2004. Then I was supposed to renew it in 2006. Mm -hmm. When I did the renewal, they denied me and said I should go home in 14 days, otherwise, they'll remove me. Wow. So we had a baby at the time, I had married in 2004. My ex-wife um, was doing a PhD at the time. My first son, Jason. Mm -hmm. Jason was just um, six months when I got this lady. So this lady became very jittery because she had a, a job in God. Ghana. She's finished her, uh, my MBA and she was doing a PhD, but she had a job. Mm. So she said, okay, let me go to Ghana, fight it out. If it doesn't work, at least we'll have a breadwinner. So that was the agreement and she went to Ghana. And I had to stay here for five days. So I changed to Dell. The first day Dell saw, interviewed me, took instructions, he got so incensed. He said, if I have to fight this case to even the European Human Rights Court, oh, I will do. Wow. 
And he said, look, I'm going to write to Tony Blair. I said, look, I've written to Tony Blair already. The blanket as I've written to <laughs> the blanket already. To read as I've written to all of them already. You've done everything. I've done everything, so I don't think that is going to work. So Richard, leave it to me. I have to write to them. So okay. So he sent me a copy of the letter. No. It's okay, fine. So he sent it to Tony Blair's office. So within two weeks, they replied. They said, they don't can't deal with it, but they've sent it to the home office. Very. I couldn't reply from the home office to apologize. Wow. They were very sorry. My situation or my application, excuse me, should have been looked up in 2002. Wow. Now, even at one at some point, the home office wrote to me that I have never made any application. They've lost the application. Oh but goodness. somehow they found they it. They found it. So on the on the 14th or so, the 7th of July, I'd gone to the airport to pick Dying Sister because Dying they still love me. Yeah. They, despite everything. I'm part of their family. Yeah. Her mother would call me, Richard, I've got this letter. Can you come and read it? Oh. They still treat me as part of their family. Was Diane white or was she Ghanaian? She, she's a Guyanese. Oh, Guyanese. Yeah, I mean, the Caribbean, relationship yeah. didn't happen because, sure. well, she was older than me too. She couldn't make any more children. Okay. And I needed children. Right. That is why. Right. Sure. Yes. But we are very, very tight. Yeah. Anything she needs, she calls me. If I can, I provide. Oh, wow. Yes. Because she changed my life. Yeah. Anyway, Pastor, they are coming. I was at the airport. Richard, are you sitting down properly? And he said, because it's very Nigerian <laughs> accent. I said, yes. He said, have you got your passport? And I said, Pastor, look, my passport is at the home <laughs> office. He said, you have got good news. Wow. I said, okay, two years, four years? He says, no, indefinitely. Wow. And I said, are you joking? He said, come to my office. I drove back. I didn't even go to his office this and I thought this man might be playing some tricks. <laughs> so the following day I went down and then he showed me all these papers and I was like, Wow. Really so I went to Ghana to see my son and my wife at the time. Wow. It was very, very emotional. I invited my mom to come and the feeling was indescribable. Wow. See my mother after all this, oh, this 1998, wow. 2007. It's amazing. It was amazing. So I got the papers and uh, in 2008, because I ran a security company, they started chasing us. They said, look, every non-white, I mean, they didn't see non-white, yeah. but ethnic minorities, bring your right to live and work here. Otherwise, you can run a security company or you cannot be a security wow. officer. So the papers, in the nick of time. Right. Perfect timing. In the nick of time. My so goodness. I send that and that is how, why I'm still in business. Yeah. Wow. So that's how I got the papers. Yeah. Wow. But in all of this, like, you didn't give up. Like, I feel as if another person or somebody that went through that situation would have probably given up. But you had the mind of trying. You had confidence and it's like you had something in you that kept you going I don't know whether it was what your mother said to you um, or what you said to yourself about what you want to do for your family what kept you going yes it's true I mean if I left hospital there's this doctor called Dr Ash he said Richard a lot of conversations have gone on People think he used the expression, and I said, Remember, it, you'll be like popcorn, popcorn eater, mm. which means that you cannot do much. You sit on the couch, watch TV, and that's all you sort of you'll be able yeah. to it. So it is true that a lot of people yeah. couldn't have enough courage. Mm. But I suppose what energized me is my family circumstances, is the experience of losing William, is the desire to redeem my family. I had this burden on my shoulder that in a generation, one person comes out from a family to change this family's circumstances. And when we lost William, I thought, thought it's now me. 
I have to do this. So even though the circumstances were very, very difficult, it was as though I'm running into the brick wall. My foot has been amputated. I still have pain even as we speak. Wow. Every single day for the past 25 years, I've had pains. I was under immigration controls. You know, things were very, very difficult. I suffered misfortunes in business. But I said, look, it's me. The family will go back two generations mm -hmm. if I don't. And thank God, I've lifted my family from one generation to the next. Wow. For the first time in my family, We've got two girls in university at the same time. The first two girls in my family to go to wow. university. I was the first person in my family to go to university. I was the first person to, to go abroad family, to become a lawyer. Wow. First person to build a house among my siblings to build a house in Accra. First person to own properties in England. So I felt that I have to deliver. Mm. I have to change the course of this family. And thank God I've done that. I've said many, many times, I'm not the most academically gifted person. But one thing I have in abundance is the drive, the perseverance. It cannot stop. I believe strongly that you only fail if you don't learn from your mistakes. Right. You only fail when you stop trying. Try. If you've got an option to either live a mediocre life, mm -hmm. or lead a life that is fulfilling. And I chose to lead a life that is fulfilling and a life that will impact on people. And God has been very good to me every step of the way. God has strategically planted people who open doors to me. Yeah. So today, as I speak to you, we should all know God has got a hand in everything I have achieved. Absolutely. It's not me. It's not me. I felt sometimes I'm the trustee of whatever I have achieved. Right. You know, and um, I don't hold back when mm. I have to help. Wow. So, yeah, so that is what kept driving me forward. It's inspiring. I mean, the fact that where you were coming from to where you are now and how you first even made your first million from nothing, from zero to six figures. How did you do that? Because even normal people that have papers have been in the same situation, probably still doing their cleaning job, are kind of satisfied where they are. I want to talk about millions. I run a multi-million pound business. Yeah, yeah but it's... Um, it's a start, you know. Um, you don't have to give up. There's plenty to do. People need help. You only fail. If you don't try. If you don't try. But you have to work hard. You have to create your own luck. When opportunity and hard work meet, then people call it luck. So it's the opportunity, I see the opportunity, and I put in the hard work. And when these two things meet, you create your own luck. Mm. And this is how the money came in. I mean, at that point, I was very broke. I remember at one point, I was broke to the extent that I didn't have fuel in my car. <laughs> One point. But you still didn't give up. No. I had to go back to the house. I came out, put in the ignition key, and there was right in there. I have to drive to my office. So I went back, look at my son's money box. I pick up nine pounds. I have to never forget that, uh, the amount. Nine pounds. I fold the car, went to work, and came. I didn't give up. You'll be beaten back. You'll be pushed back. You don't have to give up. Mm. I do remember when I bought my first house, I then had only two years. I had the two years visa. Yeah. That's what I used to buy wow. my first house. Before I bought the house, my social worker at the time said, Look, I'm moving out from this place. I don't want to live in this environment. The man said, His name is Oliver I will Smith. I will not, never forget mm. his name. He said, Richard, what are you trying to do? I think it's very stupid what you are trying, the step you are trying to take. And I said, no, Oliver, I don't want to live on government. No, I want to do my own thing. So I bought my house wow. and move in. I don't want to receive benefits. benefits. I don't need it. So these are some of the things that have shaped my, wow. my, my, my orientation in life, my perspective in life. 
And if you are receiving benefit, can we impact anybody's life? No. What examples are you going to be showing? I'm it's not true. saying benefit is not a good thing. If you do really need it, yes. But at this point, I don't need it. Yeah. Your journey is incredible. And I'm not surprised um, at the reasons why you've written it into a book. Um, what is the title of the book? Um, what made you give that particular title? Okay, the title of the book is Crashed, mm. but not destroyed. And crash the box, as long as it is not put in the bin, it's not destroyed. You can mend it. Mm. The dream of redemption, which I carried, crashed. The plans I had, the things that shaped my orientation were all crashed on the 3rd of September 1998. It was crashed. And I have recreated that. I've lived with it. It was crashed, but it wasn't lost. I held tightly to it, making sure that dream is realized. The dream is realized now. So that's why I gave the title. Yeah. Crushed, crushed but not destroyed yeah and um i believe many people can relate to it people have dreams yeah you know achieving those dreams will be difficult yeah but don't give up whether in marriage in education in business you know success is an experience experience it try everything you know you've you fail but learn from that mis uh, uh, failure and move on or Learn from that mistake and move on. Try forward. again. Yes. So when it falls apart, don't think it is gone. Mend it. Put it back together. When it crashes, it's not gone. Put it back together and move on. And move on. Yeah. Well, what an interview. Absolutely inspirational. And you have another inspirational person in your life. Who is your son? Who is happens to be the prime minister for children? Yes. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. So it looks like you've instilled something in your son. Yes, uh, Harry is the interim prime minister wow. for the children's parliament. Wow, and he's the first. He's the first. That's incredible. Yeah, he's the first. Early age, Harry seems to love politics. Okay. And uh, in his previous school in Harlow, he came home and he said, look, I've campaigned to be the school councillor. So he won. Oh. And he campaigned again the following year and won. So we moved to... Um, Suffering, he's in St. Michael's School, it's a private mm. school. And the first thing he wanted to do was to become a school counselor. So he campaigned without telling us, and he won the election to be a school counselor. Mm. And from that point, I thought, hmm, there is something here. Yeah. <laughs> so mom said, do not do it again because you'll be writing the 11 plus, we've got to stay. concentrate. <laughs> He went back to school without telling us and campaigned again and won. So he told us later that, oh, I've won the election. I said, what? You've won what election? <laughs> He's he also a school counselor for the second time. Anyway, the second time he wrote a speech and delivered a speech. So one of his teachers felt, oh, this speech is very impressive. So when the opportunity came to elect, or appoint somebody to go to represent the area at parliament. They chose him to go. Wow. So we went uh, in October last year. I took him down there to parliament. He was the only black boy there. Incredible. And I was very proud of him, the way he carried himself. Of course. So after the program, he was part of the select committee for water management and sustainability. It was chaired by Anafef, the MP for this, um, our area. Okay. And there were bosses of water companies. They grilled them. These kids really grilled them. Wow. I was sitting there. I was very proud. So after the program, the media just, wow, is he your son? I mean, I was the only black man there. He's the only black child there anyway. <laughs> is he your son? I said, yes. They said, so we want to interview him. Can you? I said, of course. So they interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And then he did very well. And uh, he concluded by saying that, uh, you know, climate change is an existential threat to humanity and that was what captured the attention wow. of these people so this year i was in the office i had a phone call from richard mm -hmm. 
your son has been appointed the interim prime minister for the children's parliament. I said, what are you talking about? Incredible. Said, He's been appointed. So I called mom. I said, mom, this is the news. Mom said, wow. That's incredible. Then a letter came to the Senate letter to the school. And on the 3rd of March this year, the news was carried in the Daily Express. Boom. Incredible. Then the week junior wanted to interview him. They interviewed him and then put his picture on the magazine front page. Wow. Football for Peace interviewed him on the UN Water Day. Mm. They interviewed him via Zoom. He spoke at the conference and uh, they've done a big program. He's part of it. And uh, last two weeks, we went to, last week actually, last two weeks, we went to the House of Lords where the grill bosses about metaverse, mm. you know, the rigs started to push to children, the safety that um, they, they'd have to put in safety features to sure. ensure that you know, children are not safe. safe yeah. And he sat side by side with Baroness Udin and Anna Faith. And MPs came to, I mean, it's incredible. Wow. He wrote a letter to the Prime Minister, Richard Sunak, and Richard Sunak wrote back. So it has been an incredible wow. day. And I hope he, he wants to be Prime Minister. Wow. Yeah. He wants to be Prime Minister. In That's fact, amazing. What amazed me, actually, is when he came back from Parliament last year, they called something school assembly. They invite parents and then they give awards. Mm -hmm. So he was invited to tell the school uh, something about what he did at Parliament. And when he finished, he said, maybe this is a step to swagger into number 10. Wow. That's what he said at the time. He was not appointed. That's he incredible. Appointed. That was last year. Wow. And this year, somehow, prophesying already. They, they, are, they are appointed this is a, incredible. a young man. You must be so proud. I am very, very proud. Do you see a little bit of yourself in him? Oh, well, I think I'm not the best child. I think people are outside the child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, very, I'm very, very proud of him. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And I'm proud of him. Proud. I mean, we are both very proud, proud of him. him. Mom is very proud of yeah, him. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. He's done his proud. Yeah. He has. He's yeah. done the family proud. And yeah. this book, I think, will go a long way. As I said, when I read it, I mm. cried. Oh, thank you. It's a very touching story of hope, a story of never giving up. Everything is possible. Nothing is impossible. Mm. And so I urge all of you who are watching the show to click on the link and see the link below and order this book. It will definitely change your life. Thank you so much for watching.